Welcome to episode 39 of Feeling Through Live. We are going to be talking everything CODA with Jack Jason, who also is an executive producer of Feeling Through. So he is very intimately part of the Feeling Through family here. And before we jump into things, um, we're going to just do a quick image description. So I am Doug and I have a little bit of scruff on my face, short dark hair, wearing a blue button up shirt, and I've got my living room behind me over my shoulder. This, on the screen we have in the top left corner, it says Feeling Through Live, episode 39, Coda, Child of Deaf Adult. Um, we have an interpreter in the top right corner. And Jack, why don't you uh, take away your image description? I'm Jack Jason, and I am a Caucasian male with short black hair with a little gray. Uh, wearing a black shirt, I'm sitting in my office with a poster behind me of Children of a Lesser God, and be next to that, Spring Awakening. And uh, that's the description of who I am. I, so I, I definitely know that why the Children of the Lesser Gods on there, but what, what's the story behind this, a Spring Awakening? Spring Awakening is a Broadway play that Marley was in. It's a revival of the original Stephen Sater um, uh, production from, I think, 2004. Oh. Uh, and they revived it uh, with Deaf West Theater with an all-deaf cast playing, well, with an all-deaf cast and a couple of hearing members. Um, so they took the, the original musical and reimagined it Instead of being set in a in a boys' school, uh, they set it in a school for the deaf, and um, it was about sexual rediscovery and oppression, and it, it applied perfectly to a deaf deaf cast, and so it ran on Broadway and was nominated for a Tony for Best Revival. Oh, that's very Probably cool. Has all the signature. So it, uh, the poster description has all the signature of the cast in on the poster, and then Children of the Lesser God is because Marley was in that back in 1986. Well, very cool. Well, you know. Why don't we hop right into what? Can you tell everyone what a coda, what that means, coda? Sure. So coda is a term used to describe people who were born with deaf parents. So a coda could be a hearing person or a deaf person who has deaf parents, and um, using that description indicates either that maybe sign language is your first language, or that you have the ability to to use English and sign language at the same time. Some CODAs don't sign at all because their parents choose not to, to sign. Uh, but it, it's to indicate that you grew up having deaf parents and it could be either that you're deaf or hearing. And I, I, I understand that you are a CODA yourself. Yes, I'm a CODA. I grew up in Northern California with deaf parents. The, there's a funny story about my parents that I can just delve into real quick. My mom was born in Los Angeles and my dad was born in New York. And when my mom was six years old, her father took her to a roller coaster, a very famous roller coaster down in Long Beach called the Pike, thinking that if she got on the roller coaster, she would scream. And if she screamed, her ears would open up. Um, and this is a common story I've heard. I've heard some of my mom's friends who were deaf say that their parents put their hand on a hot oven so that they would scream. And then somehow they would magically become hearing because they thought that the voice was connected to the hearing. This is why we heard the term deaf mute, because they thought deaf people were mute. So my mom went on the roller coaster with my grandfather. He went on the roller coaster with her. He'd never been on a roller coaster before. And when he got off the roller coaster, he had a stroke and died because it was such a traumatic experience for him. My grandmother had a nervous breakdown because she was in the middle of the depression with four kids, two of whom were deaf. They all went to various foster because she had to be institutionalized. My mom became a ward of the state and she went to the school for the deaf in Berkeley and she lived at the school. It was a residential school and in the summer she would come back and stay with relatives and in the fall she would go back to the school. When she was 13 she got a box from the teachers and said this is from a parent of another kid. It's for you. And she opens it and it's like matzahs and she doesn't know what they are. She doesn't know she's Jewish and I said this is for you. It's from this kid's mother. She knows who you are. She knows you're Jewish. And she wants you and her son to, mm -hmm. my mother's like 13, she's not interested. Flash forward, my mom's ready to graduate from the school. They find out that her mother has gotten better and moved to Seattle, Washington. Mom is no longer then considered a California resident. They kicked her out of the school. So she went through the school and then left. She moved to Seattle, she lives there, she lives with her mother, she works in a spaghetti factory, she makes pencils. And her friends say, hey, we have a guy we want you to meet. Let's go to this deaf basketball game. She goes to the deaf basketball game, it's the same guy. But now they fall in love with each other. And when they fall in love with each other, she finds out that her mother and his father grew up next to each other on the island of Rhodes. So not only are they 
neighbors, members of the same community, Sephardic Jews, their kids are both deaf, they both marry each other, and it's like a strange, what they call beshert in Judaism, like, or Yiddish. And that's, and then they have two kids, me and my brother, who are hearing, and that's who we are. Wow, that's quite the origin story there. A little bit long in the two, I'm sorry. No, it's, it but the pay, it's definitely worth the payoff. I'm wondering when we're gonna make that movie. <laughs> Well, it's it's a it's an interesting. We we were because as, as being a Sephardic Jew is a very very specific thing, and when you're in it, even within the Jewish community, you are separate because there's not a lot of Sephardic Jews in the in the San Francisco Bay Area, and a lot of a, a lot of them thought we were Mexican because we spoke Spanish, but it's not actually Spanish. It's Ladino, which is an old form of Spanish from the 1500s. So when other kids were eating bagels and lox and stuff, we didn't know it. We were eating baklava and and keftes and borekas and stuff like that that made us even more of a, you know, I look at it as a Venn diagram and, and we're the very smallest slice of the Venn diagram. It's really funny. It's really funny. I um, recently did a 23andMe um, and I, I knew I was Jewish. I didn't realize I was at first 98.9% Ashkenazi Jew and then you know how it updates because it gets more people on there and then I got updated to 99.2%. So I am... Uh, very Jewish and not very much other things <laughs> I yeah. learned from 23 and me. <laughs> a Sephardic Jew within the regular Ashkenazi Jewish community because you're, it's just, I don't know, it's just different, that's all. And then being, having deaf parents and having parents who spoke, and then we're all short and then I was chubby, my nickname as a kid was Fat Jack and so I had like one thing on top of another on top of another on top of another and then going to school um, when kids found out I had deaf parents, either they thought it was cool or they made fun. Um, one day, uh, I remember playing on this, this is a very specific memory, being on the schoolyard at around seven years old, and there's a thing about hearing your parents' voices in public that really, like, you know, alerts um, you to, like, what's going on, and I heard my dad way off, duh -ha, duh -ha, screaming my name, I was like, what's going on, and I go running to the fence, and he goes, we got a phone, we got a phone, I go, oh, because we'd always been using pay phones, um, and so I come running back, and the teacher said, who was that, and I said, oh, that's my he told us we got a phone. She goes, you just got a phone? I said, yeah. And she goes, no, everybody has a phone. I said, no, no, we just got a phone. And she goes, no, 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 no. And I go, no. She goes, why don't you have a phone? And I said, and I had never thought of this. And I said, oh, mom and dad can't use the phone. I, we, oh. So we go into the classroom, and the teacher's like, boys and girls, we have a little impromptu show and tell. Jack's going to tell us about his deaf mute parents. Come and show us, Jack. Come and show us the language. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I remember going A, B, T, and, and the kid in the back was going. So I went home and I told my mom, I said, they were kind of making fun of us. And mom goes, eh, hearing people, eh. <laughs> and that's the attitude I grew up with, you know, like, eh, hearing people, what do they know? Well, so in talking, kind of furthering that a little bit, because you were talking about how, you know, obviously each CODA's situation is different, how, you know, what the situation is, like how they identify culturally, how their parents bring them up. But for you, um, you know, can you talk about kind of like how you identified growing up culturally and, 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 you know, talk a little bit more about that? Culturally, we were, a, I identified as we were a deaf family. I remember being in school and having um, issues with English. So, for example, the same way that my parents have issues with English. Um, although mine, I had a better command of English because I had the benefit of hearing English. So, for example, when I was sick or when I had to be excused from school, my mom would write the note. My, my mom would ask me to write the note, what she should say. Then she would copy it over in her handwriting, and then I would use that note to give it to the teacher because uh, she, she, just, she felt that her English wasn't good enough for the teacher to, to look at. Um, but sometimes um, I had to interpret for myself at school when I was, you know, it was open house, and they would introduce, you know, and the teacher would say, oh, Jack is great. He does talk a lot, but that's okay, you know. Or, and my parents were never concerned about, about my grades or anything like that because they, they trusted us. They, they put their trust into us, which is a plus and a minus because if you give a six-year-old, you know, that trust, then a six-year-old will run with it, and I oftentimes ran with it. But that's the humor in having it, you know, being a hearing kid in a deaf family. But yes, I identified as deaf first, then Sephardic next, and way down the list. I didn't feel comfortable 
with my English until I got to college, until I had the benefit of having a computer where I could correct with my typing, because writing English and then having to correct it was a pro I would, you know, I would get back and say, Jack, you could say this a little better, a little differently. And I remember a teacher once said, people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. And I was like, what's that mean? And I asked my mom and dad, and they said, we don't know what that means. We don't know what that means. So it, I really didn't feel comfortable in my skin as a person who lives in a hearing world, as a person who uses English, until I got, until I started my master's degree. Um, and that's when people were, you know, doing computers, um, and I could correct myself. So isn't that kind of funny? And here I am, you know, interpreting for somebody like Marley in English. Uh, it's a very interesting journey that I, I went through. But yeah, definitely identify deaf first. But I, not I, deaf, because I'm not deaf. I can hear. Right. But but again, you're speaking, there's the distinction between actually being deaf and cult, the culture of the deaf community. Um, and, and obviously you grew up culturally in a community, in the you know, identifying with the deaf community um, because of your, where, you know, your, your parents and, and that's the strongest associations we have initially. You, you described something that I've definitely heard, you know, more from like, um, I, cause I have more reference points, both personally and in, in stories of people who are maybe, you know, first generation um, from somewhere who speak better English than their parents. So they're often tasked with, you know, having, you know, being in a doctor's office and needing to be the person that's in, like interpreting in that sense, or, you know, being wh where, whatever situation it might be the grocery store. Um, you, you were kind of starting to get at that, but uh, you, can you talk about like the dynamic of, of like, you know, obviously your parents being your parents, but also at a young age, maybe at times being the person who's leading the dance well, in a conversation. I had, I had I had uh, double. Uh, my grandparents spoke Spanish as their first language, so English was their second language. So I only heard them speaking Spanish to each other. So I had the immigrant experience that you just explained. Then I had the parents who use English as a second language and sign language as their first language. Then I had a third level in that my grandparents didn't know how to sign to speak to their parent, to my parents. So I had to act as the interpreter between them, even though I saw them attempt to speak to each other. They couldn't, so I had to often intervene. And then I had to, you know, so I was the oldest one in our family, so I was tasked with the responsibility of being that for everybody. And sometimes it was it was energizing because you give a kid all that attention, they're certainly going to enjoy that attention. But at the same time, you know, it, I, I got in trouble at school because I talked too much. I still talk too much because you're told it's okay. You know, other kids couldn't watch television late at night. My parents were watch television. It's important for you to, to tell us what's going on in the world. But then there were other times when they say, what are they seeing on television? And as a seven year old, I was like, I don't want to interpret. I just want to watch. And it was, you know, back and forth. And I found in my journey uh, as a coda through my life that I see codas of two types. One set of codas who are really involved in the deaf community and they, you know, they want to go out there and be interpreters and, and, and continue to do what they've done as kids, and others who want to leave all together because they felt the, the, the responsibility so heavily on their shoulders that they just don't want to do it and they want to live their own lives. Um, and so there, there's those two different groups of people. And it's an, I, I was more the, I, you know, I'm fine being an interpreter and continuing to be in contact with my parents. Although I remember when, when I got to college, the first day I got to college, there was a table there for the sign language club. And I said, sign language club? And I said, oh, I don't want anything to do with sign language. I, you know, I, thought that, I thought that finding a career in sign language would be too easy because it's my natural language. I want to be challenged by something else. And I wanted to be a TV weatherman. That was my goal, to be a TV weatherman. So I wanted to focus on broadcasting. And then I saw this table, it said sign language club. And I said, hey, what's this about? And they said, oh, well, you know, they teach sign language as a foreign language on campus. So if you take it, you can, and I said, oh, well, I already know it. And they said, well, then that's an easy A for you. So I took the class and the next thing I knew, I was tutoring because the teacher said, this guy knows sign language, use him. And then the next thing I knew, I was taking interpreter training classes because I found out you could make $5 an hour as a sign language interpreter. And this was back in the seventies when the minimum wage was $1.70. I said, hey, I'll do that. And then the next thing I did, it was interpreting 
and then being a coordinator of interpreters at a, a community agency, then at UC Berkeley, and then I moved to New York, and I get a call that says, hey, we're looking for an interpreter for this actress who just finished a movie called Children of a Lesser Guy, would you like? And I thought, why not? But I remember originally thinking, sign language is too easy, you know? I mean, I want, I want to learn other things, but I guess there was no way of getting around it. I just fell into it. Do you, do you ever think back on that moment where you said, why not, being that you've now, what, been together for 35 plus years, Marley and you? Um, do you ever think back to that moment, particularly given the fact that it's not like you were like seeking out to be an interpreter that time? No, it, do you ever think back and go, what if I didn't say yeah? <laughs> It makes it makes me realize that everything that happens in life is is serendipitous, or that you know it's. They say it's a lot about what you do to make things happen, but a lot of it has to do with luck. And I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. I was sitting at my desk at NYU. I was studying for my PhD in, in film and television, and a secretary knew that I was bro interpreting for Broadway shows and for people like Whoopi Goldberg on their stage shows. And she gets a call. Somebody called in me looking for interpreters. So she, just like anybody else, said, hey, somebody's looking for an interpreter. Take the job. Why not? So I took the call, and they said, oh, we're looking for an interpreter for my boss. His girlfriend is deaf. They just finished the movie. Do you know anybody? And I said, I can do it. And they said, oh, no. We, we're, he wants a, a, a woman to interpret for her. And I said, okay. And so me, always working it, I gave them the name of three women who I knew were out of town. And when they tried to call them, they couldn't find them. So they called me back, and I said, sure, I'll do it. And then it just... One thing led to another, and Marley and I hit it off when we first met. And then they asked me, you know, are you comfortable interpreting on television? And I, ham. I was like, oh yeah, I have no problem with that. Um, and because I wrote in my diary, my little kids' journal back in seventh grade, I said, I want my voice to be heard by millions of people around the world, so they won't make fun of me because I'm fat. And when she was standing on the stage accepting her Oscar and I was voicing for her, I want to thank my mother and father. My parents were also there in the audience and I got, I got a caught a little, like my voice caught and I was just like, I, I, I want to thank my mother and my father. And somebody commented after this, he's so good as an interpreter. She, she was in a very emotional moment and his voice did that. They didn't realize I was, flashing back to that little diary entry and then I'm talking to my parents up there and then I'm talking for her over there and it was so weird and yet it seemed like it was destined or something I don't know I mean who knows yeah, it's no, story. I mean clearly you, you obviously clearly wrote it into existence as a as a young boy there yeah I mean you you, you set the pattern for yourself and you do that but my intention was to be a tv weatherman but at the same time I'm you know doing goofy things on television sometimes too. So. Well, as a, as a aspiring TV weatherman, you must have really enjoyed this LA rain that we just had. Yeah, I'm mean, talking <laughs> about weather, but I my friends get really annoyed because I explain about cold fronts and, and and warm fronts and I talk about, you know, earthquakes and I know everything about earth sciences and they're like, "Jack, you really should find another career. You really know a lot about this stuff. It's just a hobby of mine. I just love weather." Um, so, you know, well, I'd be one of those people where they would chase tornadoes because I love that kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm curious, you know, as we start to talk about your um, relation, your your long time relationship with Marley, both as an interpreter and producing partner, and we'll get into that more. But just on the interpreter side of it first, you know, I, just because you were talking about initially, there were, I, you know, in dealing with a lot of people or in communicating with a lot of people, um, I, I understand everyone has their own preferences for for who they um, ideally want as an interpreter. Very familiar with that. I'm just curious, like how, you know, initially you were talking about um, they were looking for a female voice and then it ended up being you. Kind of, obviously now it just, you know, everyone knows about your, you know, your long time, uh, you know, partnership there. But like, what, were there any sort of, was there initial trepidation about a, a male being her like continual voice or was there conversation around that at I, any point? I, I've heard people say, oh, it's interesting that Marley chose to have a, a male interpreter as her voice. And I don't know if it works. I think there has to, there's something there that has to do with gender dynamics too. I, I think I heard, I don't know if it's true or not, it might be just anecdotal, that interpreters at the UN specifically are opposite genders so that it's clear that you're getting a message from uh, an interpreter and that the voice you hear is not the voice of the person, that it's just the conduit to which you hear the message. So me being Marley's interpreter, people clearly know that I'm 
expressing Marley's words, but that I am not the voice of Marley. Um, I also think it works. I also think it worked to her advantage in a lot of because of the gender dynamics too. That having a male voice put Marley out in front of what people think of female voices and or how they treat or look at women in Hollywood at the time back in the eighties. So that if she wanted to be assertive and somehow that having my voice in that m might push her just a little bit ahead. Um, and also I, I'm very proud of the fact that people say, you know, uh, when we go out on speaking engagements and we speak to 2000 people and sometimes the people who engage Marley as the speaker will say, well, how does this work? She has a guy and she's speaking through an interpreter. And I pride myself in hearing comments back that after a minute of listening to Marley speak through me, they forget that I'm interpreting and that they, they just hear Marley's message, which I guess is good, but I don't want them to think I am Marley. Um, and then we played it into a little routine with us. You know, I'm not gonna call myself a professional interpreter. I'm far from professional because, you know, Marley, Marley plays up the fact that we're, you know, I sometimes go ahead of her, but in my, in my interpreting, I wanna finish the same time she's done. So sometimes <clears throat> the way sign language is constructed, I'll go to the end of the comment and I'll bring it to the front and then finish it at the same time. And so, because Marley uses her hearing aid and she listens, she goes, wait a minute, is he talking? And she'll make a joke of it. She'll go, is he talking ahead of me? And I'll go, no, 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 Marley, like the kid who got his hand caught in the cookie jar. And then the people will laugh. And then she'll say, you know, that's just Jack, you know, but you know, at the end of the day, he's a great interpreter. He's a handsome, good looking guy. And, and she makes me say all this stuff. And then she goes, and he loves saying that about himself. And so we play this game, you know, and, you know, we were on a talk show once and, and they involved me and they always, now in real life, you don't want to talk to the interpreter. You want, you know, you want to talk to them, but I become sort of the joke and then I play along with the joke and that's okay. But yeah, it's, um, what was the original question? Um, oh yes, being the male voice. Um, it's funny. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I've heard Marley jo jokingly refer to me as her bitch, which is fine. I think that's funny. I, I just laugh because, uh, it gets me a laugh and so I, I don't mind. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I've, I've heard other people, it, it, it's funny, it doesn't seem to work the other way. When I see a strong male deaf figure being interpreted by a woman, mm. it doesn't come off the same. And maybe that's my own, my own uh, issues with gender. You know, uh, a guy interpreting for Marley is fine, but for some reason when I hear a woman interpreting for a strong male actor or whatever, I go, oh, it would be nice if it was a guy. I don't, I have to understand gender dynamics better than I probably understand myself about that. So does that make sense what I said? No, complete sense. And, and some of what you're saying about getting ahead is a perfect segue to one of the questions that we have from the audience. And Alana asks, well, she says, I just started learning ASL and the syntax is pretty different from English. Do you speak and sign simultaneously? If so, how do you keep your syntax straight in both? When you so do? that's the reason why I'm not signing now, because I, if I were signing, I would be signing in English word order, and I wouldn't necessarily be doing justice to those who might want to watch a sign language presentation. So that's why we have interpreters, because they can present the ASL more clearly than if I had to speak and sign at the same time. Um, so for example, if my parents were watching, I would be more than happy to let the uh, interpreter take over because if I were speaking and signing, it would be in English and English is not the first language. So uh, it is interesting, it's you know what we used to call SimCom and what they employed on Switched at Birth, but you know you have, to, you have to bend the rules a little bit. So for the purposes of an audience wanting to watch somebody signing to a deaf person and not have to rely on subtitles and use SimCom, but now, Subtitles are in, subtitles are cool. You have movies like this year's Minari, you have a Parasite from last year, you have all sorts of, you know, uh, of, of world cinema coming in through our Netflix and our Amazons with subtitles and people are comfortable. So that's why, for example, in Coda, you know, half the movie is subtitled what the characters sign. Roger Ebert said when Children of a Lesser God first came out and they employed this, this technique where every time Marley's character signed, then William Hurt's character would repeat what she was saying for purposes of the audience to be able to understand, rather than subtitle mark. Because back then, subtitling was not cool. But now it's all cool. So now a, a deaf actor can just feel free to communicate and not have to worry about a character who's an interpreter, who signed, who speaks for them, or who repeats what they say, because that doesn't happen in real life. 
maybe a little bit. Like when you're mad and you talk to, like when I was mad as a kid and I talked to my mom and dad, I'd say, I don't want to go to school today. I don't want it. You know, and I would say it because of course I'm a hearing person who's mixed up in his mind. But in reality, and in fact, the CODAs on the set of CODA told, you know, we advised the director. It said she would speak here because she's so mad that she has to speak. And then they put that in there. So it, it's, it, it's interesting to, to think about how you want to, Okay, I lost myself in the question again. It was so, so typical of me. Um, about what, what was the question? I don't remember either, but everything you're saying is great anyway. So <laughs> there's, a sign, there's a sign that I'm like this. I'm like, good mm, 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 mm. point. Oh, I think point. we were initially talking about syntax, but we kind of. Oh, right, like, right. It is. Yeah. Thank you. It is. It is. It is a. It. It wasn't until like 1960 uh, where it was actually recognized as its own language. You know, deaf people for so long were. Their language was repressed. They, 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 you know, sat on their hands. They were punished for being for signing. A lot of them associated sign language with the smell of urine because they could only sign in the bathrooms at school. And then finally had that breakout moment that you know that oh we we have a language. And it culminated with the Gallaudet uprising in 1988, where they said, hey, we as deaf people have a right to choose our own fate. We don't want hearing people to choose our fate any longer. I mean, it took a long time from the Milan conference of the 1870s when Alexander Graham Bell said that only hearing people should teach deaf people and that deaf people shouldn't. Up, up until that point, there were deaf teachers everywhere. And then they just banned them. And then it took like another 100 years before they were recognized again. Wow. It's an interesting journey. It's a really interesting journey. A couple other questions um, from, the, from the viewers here. Um, Ruby asks if you've ever interpreted for someone who's deafblind. Who's deafblind? Yeah. Um, when I was in, when I was doing freelance interpreting before I met Marley, I was a freelance interpreter, and I did interpret for deafblind. And I employed, I remember working in two different types of situations. One, in which they put their hands on my hands, and I signed. And my mom and dad had some deafblind friends. Um, my mom and dad had some deafblind friends, and so uh, I remember talking that way. And then I remember there were people who used a typewriter. And I would type into the typewriter, and then they put their finger on the back of the typewriter with Braille, and they would read Braille that way. So they were non-signing deaf individuals. So I've done both. I've never employed, um, I don't know if this is called the Chidoma method, where somebody had to actually put their hands on my face. Um, I never used that. But um, certainly I'm signing uh, like that. And, and I, I, I still, I've seen that a lot. I, I haven't done it in a while, but I remember doing that very clearly. And and another question is, do you miss signing for Broadway? I do. I do miss signing for Broadway. I did it. Um, I did it like four years ago, five years ago, for a play, and I went back to my with my friends who I used to interpret on Broadway with, and um, I did. I like it. I don't like doing musicals because somehow when I sign songs, I feel like everybody's looking at me, and I'm. I look at interpreting on stage for musicals or I mean for shows as as interpreting. And when I when I'm doing a song, I feel like I'm performing, and I and it gets a little I get a little self conscious. Um, I have to say, my first job interpreting for a show uh, on a stage was for Whoopi Goldberg. This was before I met Marley, and she wanted me to stand on the stage with her, which is unusual. Usually, they want you to stand in front. She wanted me to stand on stage. And the opening of her show is she's in the dark and she's playing a drug addict singing around the world in 80 mother effing ways. And so I thought, wait, it starts out in the dark. So how are we going to do this? So we invented this idea of having a spot, a little pen light, and you just see my hands and I'm going around the world in 80 mother ways <laughs> and it, they were like what's going on here and um marley met her a couple months later and i we all became and we still you know looked back and we met Whoopi before she had like four people in the audience when i first interpreted for her show nobody knew who she was and i got to see her expand and then i met marley and then they became friends it all became a strange what i call jewish geography even though they're you know Whoopi's not well Whoopi is jewish but, um, or was converted or i'm not sure but anyway it's this strange 
It's a small little world. Hollywood is just small little worlds, small little worlds. It's the same small world as Marley and Henry Winkler. She was 12 years old. She met Henry Winkler because he came to see her in a show. He said, you should be whatever you want to be. Don't let anybody tell her otherwise. They kept in touch. She wins the Oscar, but people don't believe she deserved the Oscar. She turns to Henry for advice. He invites her for the weekend to stay over at her, his house with his wife to think it over. She lives there for two years. She becomes like their second daughter. She gets married at the house. And it's all because at 12 years old, they met. It's all, it's all these strange little small worlds that we all revolve in. I'm going to take a quick pause for an interpreter switch. Thank you to our interpreters, by the way. Always. All right. We're continuing here. Um, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to get into the film coda in a moment, but I actually had a one more question kind of of where we're, you know, in the vein that we're on right now. You know, um, I, when I think of, just from the advantage point of being an interpreter, when I think of, you know, interpreters, I think of how much responsibility there is, especially when you are the, you know, go-to interpreter for for someone um, like you are with, with Marley. And I'm wondering if, I'm sorry, I need to switch this interpreter screen as well. My apologies. Um, I'm wondering if um, you've ever had an instance where um, you feel like, it, well, first of all, can you talk about that responsibility or how you deal with that and what your relationship is to li like to that? And also if there's ever been a moment where like you feel like there was such a gaff that you were like really like taken aback by it or you just felt like something didn't quite go the way you wanted it to and you kind of like didn't know how to well, deal you know, with it. If, if you know Marley and me, I mean, clearly the relationship we have goes beyond just a typical interpreter-client relationship. I, that's why I said I'm not a professional interpreter by means. We're friends, we're producing partners, um, she's like family. And the naturally there's gonna be situations and we've talked about this in public where we argue with each other or we fight. And it's just natural. It's just, you can't, you can't be in somebody's space all that time and not eventually get to a point where you argue. And there's a, and I don't usually find myself, I don't think myself I'm making a gap, but clearly Marley sees it that way because she's the one who's using me as her voice. And at some point she might've said something that, that just ticked me off. And it's a natural response on my part. It may not have been appropriate, but it was just natural, I couldn't help it. So I said, I'm not interpreting. Now as an interpreter, you cannot do that. Uh, you can't just say, I'm, you're, I'm there, I'm making the communication decision for this deaf person. That's a big no-no. But as I said, we're beyond that. So I just said, I'm not interpreting. And the publicist said, Jack, you get your ass over there and interpret. And I said, no, I'm not doing it. I was being a baby. I said, no, I'm not doing it. I said, you, I said she was not nice to me. And I said, well, okay, that's my perception. No, no, no. And they said, Jack, get it. we're ready to go live. I said, fine, okay. So I sit down and I, you know, in some language I kind of do this. And I pull it together. And the first question the interviewer asks is, like, Marley, you and Jack have such a wonderful relationship we've watched over the years. Can you tell us how you two first met and how it is, you know, do you, how it is you guys get along so well? And I thought to myself, oh, crap. Okay, this is like some, uh, some movie or something like that. And she goes, and Marley, being Marley, she goes, you know, Jack and I have worked together for a number of years and uh, sometimes we argue and, uh, you know, and it, you know, we get into it and then at the end of the day I realized, you know, everything is okay and, and Jack's a good guy and he does what he does so well and I really appreciate it and I don't think I could, you know, he makes me look good. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, I think she's apologizing to me, but I don't get the pleasure out of hearing the apology from her. I'm saying it to myself. And then I look up to Marley and all I see is this one eyebrow go like this. I can't do it. It goes like this. And I went, oh my God, she just did it. And I realized I'm apologizing to myself. I don't get the pleasure of hearing from her. And then after that, it was over. And we find ourselves having little arguments when we're in enclosed spaces. You know, like we're on a plane and we can't escape from each other. Or in a car and she's calling up a Hollywood executive to scold him. And I said, Marley, you cannot do that because I, I want to be controlling. I don't know. You can't call him on the phone and scold him and just get out of the car. You're fired. I'm like, what car's moving? I can't go. So she calls up the executive and the secretary answers and she talks on the phone because Marley can. And she goes, hi, can I speak to so-and-so? And she goes, who's calling? It's me, Marley Matlin. And she's like, how is Marley calling me on the phone? I'm like, and I'm thinking, what is she going to say? And she goes, well, can you tell him shame on you? And I'm like, oh. 
it's <laughs> there are times when I messed up and I've tried to cover it, but she catches me. She catches me doing it. And what can I say? I mean, I'm human, I make mistakes, but to do it publicly, I I really am very aware of the public persona she has. And as an interpreter, I try to make her sound as natural. I don't try to stay, you know, a lot sometimes in real life situations, interpreters will stay behind so they can get the whole message to catch up. I dead air on television doesn't work. And I don't want people to to hear Marley going and or go, uh, or go, you know. Um, I really pride myself on being able to sound as natural as possible. Some people like that. Some people say I'm not realistic as an interpreter. Some people say that I'm adding things. But at the end of the day, it's the same message. And every once in a while, I do mess up. And she, she, she busts me for it. She catches me. It's, it's, it's just natural. What am I supposed to do? I can't be perfect. That I just to go back to that story of you two getting into that fight before that interview. It's such a. It's. I mean, it's hilarious. But it's also like really touching, because it and and really gets at the real specificity and uniqueness of of that kind of dynamic and relationship. Um, and I just love the like that the way in which that kind of roundabout, but also like, to me, kind of touching way of an apology, even though at the time it might have felt frustrating that you're essentially, like you said, apologizing yourself. But I think that's just such a beautiful example of that dynamic and how you can have these really, um, you, that you're communicating on multiple levels when you're, when you're interpreting for someone and that you're both quite literally in that moment interpreting and being her voice while also having a conversation with her is such a fascinating dynamic. Or there are times when I find myself interpreting on a stage and she's doing, and this is, I think, an interpreting. I've, I've seen this before I met Marley, where I can be signing what's going on and I, there's the part of my brain that's passing along the message. And then there's the behind that message where I'm thinking about what do I have to do today? Do I have to go do my laundry? Do I have to do this? It's a multitasking thing that, that teachers as a kid couldn't understand that I could do, that I could say, you know, I could talk to a kid next to me in class when I'm not supposed to be talking. And listen to the message at the same time. I, if it has to do with left brain, right brain things, if it has to do with learning sign language first, which gives me a, a certain brain function, then learning to English lit, and then connecting. I always believe that codas have more pathways opened up in their brains than non codas do because you're processing language physically as well as processing it through speaking and listening. And so it, we have an ability that I think a lot of other people don't understand or you know, use as well as we do. So I can do that. And then sometimes I, but then sometimes I get ahead of myself and which causes a problem or sometimes I never get behind. And I, I'm also, um, I'm also proud of the fact that I can, um, look at 95% of people using sign language and be able to understand and voice them appropriately. Whereas, uh, some other interpreters are stronger in their presentation of sign language. Um, I've always been proud of my fact that I can speak, uh, translate into English in a way that fits the person who's speaking. Um, I do a lot of, um, uh, on the side, I do some uh, sign language uh, relay interpreting. And I just love to see all the different kinds of deaf people that come through and voice for them, whether they're angry at their kids or they're ordering a pizza or whatever. And just, it's almost like you're taking on different roles. And it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun for me sometimes to do that. As someone who grew up, um, you know, with deaf parents, culturally deaf and signing first, do you, does signing feel like, like still to this day, more like your most authentic expression when you're communicating? Do you, do you prefer to communicate that way over voicing or how, how would you talk about that? I, I've never been a person who, who will sign without any person who uses sign language present. I have friends who just sign for the heck of it. Um, but, uh. I'm very comfortable signing, I'm, but there are a lot of sign language interpreters who I admire for their ability to just really get into the ASL so strongly. I haven't had to practice it as much because Marley chooses to use um, a more English-based form of sign language. Um, she'll say that she didn't grow up with ASL, she grew up with signed English. And so in speaking and signing with her, that's, uh, that's been my focus lately. When I met her, I was very ASL. I'm still ASL when I speak to my parents. But on a daily basis, it's more signed English. Um, and there are some interpreters I'm just like, wow, they're just like, great. But I do get a lot of compliments from deaf 
uh, consumers who say, wow, you must be a coder, right? Because I could just see it. You could just tell your signing is something you grew up with as opposed to something you learn later. But I've met, I've met people who aren't coders who sign like they are. And it's just, it's just something natural. And I just love to watch it, sign, signing and people who are really good. I just love to watch it. I, I find myself going back and forth and back and forth all the time. You know, as someone who uh, is in the very early stages of my signing journey, if I can even say that at this point, you know, something that I, re but being around a lot of signing um, and sign language, um, given the nature of obviously feeling through platform, um, what I love about what I, when I see someone signing, it's similar to like what I feel as someone who, um, whose singing is not meant for anything other than in the shower and not for anyone to hear. When I see someone who can really sing, it, it feels like it's such a beautiful expression that you, 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 you can't quite access with your voice, right? Like a speaking voice, like you, you I, I mean, there's, there's this like great quote about, um, actually Steven, our actor said it last night. I forget you, you, you sing what you can't say and you dance what you can't if you're okay. Well, anyway, but point is, it looks like this, that you can almost communicate in a way that like your voice kind of can't quite get to that. It's almost like, um, you access kind of a different level of communication, um, through the real physical, um, nature of, of the language. It's there's, you're speaking about language, which language has always fascinated me. I've had for many years an interest in, uh, in Italian and in French. And I've learned Italian. I haven't quite mastered French at all. But I remember going to Italy and spending my summers there. And I, I noticed there's two reactions to people being in different language environments. One, they get extremely frustrated. They want to know everything that's being said. Whereas my experience in living in Italy was I let the Italian just wash over me. And I didn't understand everything. But I just loved listening to everybody speaking in Italian and watching and making a connection about what they're talking about, which I guess is a representation of what I grew up with sign language is just watching language and, and, and trying to put together thoughts and ideas. Even if you don't understand one word, it's the way we read. When you pick up a book and read, you don't read word, 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 word. You, you, you make the connection, you, you, you fill it in. And so I just love to be in environments that I, you know, I'm watching this TV show called uh, call my agent and another show called Lupin and they're all in French. And I just love to just absorb the language, just to hear it. And, and, and I just love language environments. I love to be in any language environment so I can just not understand and just try to figure it out. It's, you know, it's like why, you know, somebody says to me, well, is sign language international? And you go, no, it's not. Well, then how do deaf people from other countries talk to each other? So, because you have a basis of nonverbal communication, you can express yourself nonverbally. There are universal cues except if they're cultural. So for example, you cannot say this in Brazil, someone told me, because that means something else, even though here it means okay. Or in Japan, the sign for brother indicates the middle finger. You have to be careful about cultural differences, but they can communicate, you know, you far away, come what, you know, and, and they can communicate. And it's the same thing. I love sitting in a room and everybody's speaking a different language. And I'm just like, I just love it. I just love languages. I just love languages. We have another great question from Alana and she writes in children of a lesser God, Marley signs that she wants deaf children. Generally speaking in deaf culture, is it common to struggle with the idea of having hearing children? Well, the reality is, and this is a statistic I've heard. The reality is that 90% of people who are deaf have hearing children. So the remaining 10% is either as a result of some sort of, of, of genetic, um, uh, you know, passing down genetics. And I found out myself after one of these DNA tests that I have a gene that has been known to cause deafness. So clearly in my mom's family, it's not my dad's family, or it could be, there was the gene that caused either one of them to be deaf, if they passed it along to us, that we didn't uh, become deaf. So um, I have heard there are families and there are stories of families when they find out that their child is hearing and they're, they're like, there's generations of deaf people. They're a little bit like, oh, you know, or somebody who's deaf and their child is born hearing and the nurse says, congratulations, your baby is hearing. And the woman is like, congratulations. I, I'm, what does that mean? Being deaf is bad or, or something like that. And so that's an interesting dynamic there. Um, there, I know families who are, like generations and generations of deaf people, and then they have a hearing child. And um, then there's 
you know, generations and generations of hearing people, then they have a deaf child. Uh, and so I think it's easier for the hearing child to be born into a generationally deaf family than it is for a deaf child to be born into a generationally hearing family, because more than likely they will not learn to sign, whereas the hearing child in a deaf family will learn to speak and sign with their parents. So, Do, Have you ever found that, like, have you ever felt, um, have, you, have you ever gotten pushback from, I'm trying to think of, ask this more specifically, but like being someone that's very much straddled, you know, multiple worlds your whole life, um, but being culturally deaf from your upbringing, have you ever found yourself identifying as culturally deaf, but finding yourself in situations where you're like not accepted by like, a, like a deaf, some sort any of deaf sort community? Of, in any sort of minority majority dynamic or anybody who straddles two worlds because they're born you know, uh, physically different than the family that they come from or try to integrate themselves into a family that they, they aren't like, you'll find that there's this dynamic, uh, and especially being in the public eye, you'll find the dynamic like, oh, you're not a professional enough interpreter, or oh, you don't have the right to say things about your deaf family, it's only up to them to decide, or oh, you, you're, you're representing us incorrectly. And, and, and I'm just learning about that now because I guess with this film that Marley just came out with, with Coda, um, there are people who have certain opinions and I have to learn to just let them slide off my back, but it's hard. Um, and then there's people who you know, say it's wonderful. There, there is really an interesting dynamic lately, especially when it comes to CODAs. I found that a lot of people in the deaf community have an issue with CODAs because some CODAs, uh, choose to speak on behalf of the deaf community and the deaf community doesn't want them to do that. Other deaf people say, fine, let them speak because they're culturally like us, even though they're not deaf. And it's an interesting back and forth. It's, it's this issue of being woke or, or privileged or whatever it may be. And social media has given those people an opportunity to speak their minds. And it's not necessarily always pretty. But then again, sometimes it's very enlightening too. It's nice to know other people's thoughts and opinions. And I just have to learn to let it just go. I must stay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you've mentioned a couple times now, and and um about the film in named Coda that actually just premiered last night at Sundance in uh, one of the most coveted film slots of the year. Um, and you know, I, I just before we get into that, I find it funny because we've been talking about. Um, getting on this uh, show together to talk for a while and, and that coda would be kind of the, the the overarching theme and it just so happened that the timing worked out that it's the night after the premiere of the film which has already gotten tons of rave reviews. Can you tell us a little bit about that film? So the film originally was a French movie called La Famille Bellier. It was a French film uh, about a young girl who lived on a farm who wanted to be a singer. Uh, the producers of the film, uh, that was in 2014, and it won a, a number of awards, César Award uh, for their actors, and it was, it was a big box office hit in Europe. Um, the producers approached Sean Hader, the director of a movie called Tallulah that premiered at Sundance in 2016, to remake the film, but from an American point of view. Um, and Sean um, decided to embark on this journey. So she first started learning sign language. She talked to sign language masters. She got people to help her work with the script. And then she began the casting process. And she had to, she had to overcome some barriers. She had to overcome some financiers who, who had an issue with deaf actors playing the role, the very prominent roles of the parents. Because in the original French film, both actors were hearing playing deaf. So they wanted at least one of them to be played by a well-known actor. Uh, when Marley was approached to play the part of the of the mother in the film, she insisted that it had to be a deaf actor who played the role, and they were able to do that. Uh, the The film then was uh, was changed from a farm to a fishing village called Gloucester, Massachusetts, because that's where Sean is from, Boston, and she knew the fishing community very well, and she felt that the dynamic of these working class fishermen would fit in well to the story about a young girl growing up as the only hearing member in her deaf family uh, and the one responsible for interpreting for her parents and being the, the ears for everything that goes on with the fishing business. But things changed. The fishing business changed. And then 
she started to flower as a young girl who found herself interested in becoming a singer. And of course, as Marley's character said in the movie, you wanting to become a singer would be as if we were blind and you want to be a painter. And what does that mean to us? And that's a natural thing. You know, it's the kind of thing that, that all codas face. Should I do what I want to do or should I do what my parents want me to do? And then the film explores the journey of, of this young character, Ruby Rossi, uh, through learning how to sing and becoming a singer and her parents pushing back. We need you. We, we want you to interpret. And she goes, you're adults. You couldn't, you know, my parents used to say, I, I felt a very big responsibility of interpreting for my mom and dad. And when I left, I would worry all the time. And mom and dad said, we were fine before you were born. We'll be fine after you leave. Don't worry. Um, and in this film, it's a little bit different. And I've seen parents like this. We need you to interpret for us. And she's like, but I want to. And it, 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 it really touched. I mean, I watched the movie uh, last week and I was just like sobbing because it touched so many you know, points in my life in the film. And it, it was just, it's just, I hope people get to see it when it comes out and they'll really love it, I think. Really will. And, you know, you, you also, again, we, we would mention this a little bit earlier, but I want to get into it a little bit more at the time we have left. Um, you've not only been working with Marley as her interpreter for many years, but as, as a producing partner. Can you talk a little bit about that side of your relationship? So, Initially, the journey was with Marley as just being her interpreter and, and just embarking on that. But I had a chance to observe that as Marley, you know, you know, she won the Oscar and you know, some critics said that she didn't deserve it because she was a deaf person playing a deaf role or the kinds of scripts that she was getting. And she would ask me to look at them and say, does this, how does this look? And I said, well, I think you could do better than that. That I used my background in, in, in film and television at NYU and to start, you know, maybe I can help you find other stories and I remember the first thing we pitched after she did Children Lesser God, we went into Paramount, and I they 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 said, "What do you what you know what what else can Marley do?" And I said, and I learned real quick that it's all about the the pitch that you make. And I said, "Imagine wait until dark, but with a deaf person." And they went, "Oh!" And I went, "Oh, that's how you sell a movie." Okay, fine. So then I started to develop pitches and ideas, and then we start. I started reading books, and I started finding things on. You know, the internet, uh, how, what it is that Marley could do. And then it was all about, oh, let's foster relationships. Because in Hollywood, it's about who you know and who you can. So, hey, let's talk to this producer. Or, you know, why not go to this producer and say, you know, Marley Matman loved your project. What, is there something else we can do together? And Marley learned, the, Marley learned the same thing. And it started to build and build and build until now, you know, I'm her producing partner, finding projects. So, for example... We're doing the story that I found when we were in New York about Prince Philip's mother, who was deaf, uh, Prince Philip being Queen Elizabeth's husband, who saved Jews during World War II, unbeknownst to the family, and her journey and her story, uh, or the story of this um, of a doctor who you know discovered a heart procedure who happened to be deaf herself, or even fictional stories that just happen to have deaf characters in them. Um, it's just about you know every every actor in Hollywood who has a production company, has somebody working on their behalf to find projects that they can produce, that they can do. And I just fill that role. I also happen to be your interpreter too, so. A couple uh, last questions before we part today, but Zach asks, um, are your siblings interpreters? No, my brother, is, my brother is serving as my mom and dad's interpreter uh, where they live, but professionally he's not an interpreter, he's an accountant. Um, I was the one who became the, the interpreter. But even still, I, I can say I'm an interpreter, but I'm more of a, a producer and a partner for Marley who happens to be her interpreter. But my main role is not as her interpreter only. Because again, if I was a professional interpreter, I wouldn't be doing all the producing stuff. I would just be the interpreter. But clearly people know that I play both sides of the fence. And, and Judith asks, how much harder is it to sign for people who one doesn't know? It seems when it works most effectively, you're sort of an alter ego and have a context for what that person is expressing. I've been in situations where I've interpreted things and I have no idea what I'm saying, but I say it as best as I can. Um, I've interpreted for like technical, uh, you know, they're talking about IT things and I have no idea what they're saying, but I do my, I, based on what I hear and usually the person in the internet goes, I know what you're saying. Don't worry about it. I know it's, you're, you're doing fine. And I, it frustrates me to no end to go, I don't know what's going on. 
I, I can't even figure out. And I'll, I'll be happy to say, wait a second, can you please tell me? They'll use a name sign for something. And I was like, I don't know what that name sign is. Who's that person? And I'll just ask for clarification. Or well, people who have a very distinct accent and I can't hear what they're saying. And I, I ask for clarification and usually they don't, they just keep going and I just do the best I can. Uh, but yeah, I've been in situations where I, I'm totally clueless and hopefully I do a good job. And I'm the first to admit, I, I, I always, when I'm done, I say, I'm sorry. I didn't, and they go, oh no, you're fine. You, you did fine. I'm like, really? I don't know what I said. You know, what, 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 what were we talking about? For, you know, for someone who obviously has never done anything like that, my only reference point is I'm thinking of like, those dream, those like stress dreams I have where I'm like standing up in front of a class about to give a presentation about something I don't know at all. Your number, or you come to school without your shoes. Right, right. You know, um, a... <laughs> I just like, I, I, I constantly have this dream that I'm in a musical and it's ready to perform. I, say, I don't know the words. I, I don't know the words. I have this dream all the time. It's a representation of that fear. I don't know the words, which, oh, you know, and then I wake up and I go, it's not real. <laughs> So um, we, we have a hard out in a, in a minute or so, but just with like kind of last uh, closing words here, is there anything else you want to you wanna say before no, we part ways for I hope that people get a chance to see Coda when it gets a distribution deal. Um, I'm sorry that the film was sold out for Sundance. I heard that 5,000 tickets went out the window like really fast and then they resold some more tickets and they got sold out. But the movie would, I imagine based on the comments and the, and the praise that the film is getting, it will get a distributor and then it'll be available on whatever platform or whatever theater you can see that. And I hope people enjoy it. Um, I think, and I can't wait to hear what will happen with Feeling Through. I'm so very proud to be associated with Feeling Through. I think uh, Marley and I, I mean, I think you know this, we wouldn't just jump on any project, but we were so proud of what you did as a director and, and writer of it. And so glad you uh, asked us to be a part of it as producing partners. We're very proud of what you did and very proud of the actors and everybody in the film. Well, it's been an honor truly an honor to have you both on board and, and also to get to know you both over this time. I, I really was so super excited to talk with you today because we've gotten to talk a lot offline, but this was a great opportunity for me to get to know you better. And I was super interested in everything you had to say today and so glad you joined us. And uh, I'll, I'll probably twist your arm and, and have you be a part of some of our other conversations. Yeah, come on, you know, uh, so, and then you'll see, you'll see the just different side of me. Oh yeah. We'll, we'll have you, we'll have you both back on soon for sure. Thank you so much, Doug. Thank you. And thank you to the interpreters. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all for joining today. We will be back again next week with another episode. Until then, have a great weekend. Make sure you check out Coda when it's available. And of course, you can watch Feeling Through. Go to feelingthrough.com. It is up for everyone to watch. Share it with people. And uh, we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. -bye.